Hi, everybody, and welcome again to another great segment in our Women Lead online forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And today we bring you Sean Marine Turry and Truth is the New Black, a thought provoking fireside style virtual conversation series. It's real talk about business and life and career, about desire and disappointment, about truth and what it takes to create a life and a work that you love. Sean Marie is a multi-passionate and multi-talented business strategist who helps businesses get things done and leaders lead better. And she's an irrepressible seeker of the truth. As a master desire map facilitator, she's taken hundreds through her programs. And she is my partner in crime here in the Women Lead online forum series. So Sean Marie, go ahead and tell us what you have for us today. Thank you so much, Patty. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy that you could join us tonight. And thank you for choosing to spend an hour with us. I know that there are, especially these days, a lot of options. And the fact that you have chosen to be here means the world to me. So thank you so much. And tonight, I have the pleasure of having a dear friend of mine and our special guest, Skylar Robertson. And Skylar is... Um, Gosh, there are so many ways that I could talk about her, but Skylar is the founder of Elevated Model. She had her own modeling agency in Colorado, and she is currently in transition. Uh, she has previously worked for a company called Wizards Brew, which is an organic pesticide company uh, that is completely plant-based and organic and has CBD as one of their primary uh, chemicals. Um, actually, I don't even know that you'd call CBD a chemical, but as one of their primary ingredients, uh, they had CBD and um, and events was a big part of her background, which I'm sure that she'll tell you a little bit more about. So with everything that's going on with COVID, uh, her professional life has also, like with many of us, been turned upside down a little bit. But Skylar, I'm so happy to have you here, honey, and thank you for joining us. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be part of the conversation tonight. Yeah, I am too, Skylar. And this is something that Skylar and I have actually talked a lot about just in our personal time together. But uh, tonight's topic is stop competing, start celebrating, there's enough for everyone. And even though we have only women on our call tonight, I know that this is not exclusive for women, but I do feel like it is particularly high stakes for women um, because I know that in my lifetime as a businesswoman and an entrepreneur, I have definitely had my fair share of encounters and experiences with women when I felt completely celebrated and when I felt supported and nurtured and seen. And I've also had the experience where it was the exact opposite, where I felt not only was I not being celebrated or competed with, but that there was actually this undertone of wanting me to not make it. And I do think that there is enough for everyone. There's enough to go around. It has to do with the deep work and having the willingness and the desire to really want to and choose to see one another in this light. And, and I think especially from the perspective of, you know, like if we are going for a particular job or a project or a gig and there's only one to be had you know what do we do when we find ourselves in those situations where it's me or it's them or it's me or it's her you know how do we feel when that goes to someone else you know so we're going to talk about all kinds of things tonight we're going to open up the conversation to what some of your experiences have been and ideally between Skylar and Patty and myself we really want to hold the space and the container to help create this conversation and to be of support to you in any way that we can. And hopefully by the end of our call tonight that you will have made some maybe new discoveries about yourself or had a slight shift in perspective. And ultimately my goal and my desire is that you leave this call knowing and experiencing how worthy you are, how deserving you are, that the special gifts that you have to put out into the world really, really matter, that you matter. Like at the, at the core of it, that's really what this is about, that you matter, no matter what your circumstances have been, no matter what your experiences have been, that from this place right now, 
doing the work that we are all doing together that you matter. So with that, I would love to kick things off with a quote uh, that I absolutely love by Elizabeth Gilbert. And I, and just a really quick side note, like hashtag real life. Um, I'm in my little office sanctuary, which I love. And I'm also surrounded by uh, 12 kittens who we are essentially fostering and their four moms. So if you hear this, <laughs> if you hear the chattering in the background, that's, that's what that is. So um, that's definitely coming from my end. But I, I wanted to kick things off for all of you tonight with this. So this is by Elizabeth Gilbert. The women I love and admire for their strength and grace did not get there, did not get that way because shit worked out. They got that way because shit went wrong and they handled it. They handled it a thousand different ways on a thousand different days, but they handled it. And those women are my superheroes. And I know that we all have had those experiences of things going our way, things not going our way. Um, but that's part of what I wanted to kick this conversation off with tonight is, is how do we handle it when not only are we not being celebrated, but how do we receive it when we are being celebrated, when we are being acknowledged, when somebody actually sees us and recognizes us for the things that make us magnificent, for the things that are magic? And how do we in turn reciprocate that and see someone else and celebrate someone else and, and also hold a space of grace and growth for someone else. So Skylar and I love this topic. We love this conversation. Uh, I am definitely uh, somebody who wants to celebrate our special guest tonight and uh, the friendship that I have with her, the work that she's doing in the world and where she is right now on her path of discovering what is next for her. So Skylar, I'd really love to start things off uh, between you and I in this conversation with a question to you. And I'd love it if you could share with us an experience that you've had uh, and you, and please feel free to share both, but I'd love to know of an experience that you've had where you have felt truly celebrated and seen and supported and encouraged and maybe even gotten some tough love um, but in a really truthful organic way that you knew that was meant to help you from another woman and what the opposite of that has been like for you when you felt that somebody was combative and and competing and not celebrating um, so you can Take your pick, my darling, but I, I'd love to know, like, what have those experiences been like for you, and, and how have you navigated and found the self-agency to process that information and come out the other side? Yeah, I think those are really important. I think it has taken me a long time to find women who really have supported me. Um, it's it, do, it doesn't come very... Um, easily or very often, especially women in my age range, you know, um, it, they're still early in their careers, you know, they really do feel like there's not enough to go around. They feel, you know, there's so much competition and then they also, he goes, override their feelings um, and all of that. So um, with the negatives, I guess, um, I mean, I've been run out of nearly every single job I've ever had, um, and from restaurants to sales, sorry, um, from restaurants to sales, um, and women are nasty. I mean, and it's nasty. I mean, lies, rumors, you know, um, it, the list goes on and on, um, but I think the best way that I've found for me to really be able to overcome that is having grace for them. Like there's a big part of me that feels sorry for them, that they are so wrapped up in what I'm doing that they can't see what they're doing to themselves. Um, you know, realizing that they're not at an emotional point or a professional point to be able to really move forward in their own lives. Um, I think there's something when you're constantly comparing yourself to other people 
um, you can't focus on yourself enough to allow yourself to grow. Um, so while there may have been a lot of nasty experiences, I really just have to have grace for them and realize that, you know, um, I am at a different level, whether it's a better or not, that's, it's not really the case. Um, you know, um, but over and through the years, like I, I don't want to surround myself with petty people. I don't want to be a petty person. Um, and those people showing me their true colors has really allowed me to weed through the people and not waste my time necessarily pouring my heart into people that aren't going to be able to accept it because I love people. I want to see them succeed. I want to see them happy. I want to see them grow. I want to see them, you know, successful in their careers and their relationships. Um, and so by, by natural default, it has allowed me to weed out a lot of people. So for that, I'm grateful. So I think it's just finding those little silver linings, um, even if it has made my life un unnecessarily harder. Um, and really it's, the one thing that has made that harder and um, I, that's not something I can change you know um, but the women that have been here have been amazing um, you I think are a prime example you know someone who has really shown me a lot of empathy you know wants to see me grow helps redirect me um, and other people in my professional space I was on a different call earlier um, you know, and they had a hundred people on the call and immediately she texted me and thanked me for being there and, you know, told me if there's anything that I can do to, to help you succeed or anything that you need, like, let me know. That's what I'm here for. And, um, finding people who want to go out of their way that also want to see other people succeed, you know, they're, they're the little diamonds in the rough and we really have to hold on to those type of relationships and, you know, feed them as much as possible. And Skylar, let me ask you this. I, I know that you touched on it a little bit, but can you know, can you give us a specific example of um, and, and that's if this has happened for you, but can you give us a specific example possibly of when you've had one of these encounters? And I know also like not only being a model, but owning a modeling agency. Um, you know, where so much of that work is based on, I mean, not so much, I suppose, all of it is based on aesthetics, right? It's looking a certain way or having a certain body type or, you know, or fitting, fitting a particular mold. And I think it's interesting because that's the very thing that we're talking about is that there is no particular mold, right? That we all have this wonderful, unique gift, every single one of us. And I mean, everyone, like even... And I, I want to just beg everybody's pardon in advance because I don't know where you are politically, but um, I'm not a, a fan of our current administration. But I think that even, you know, that particular human being, like, I think that there are there are elements of goodness and grace. And I think it's really up to us to tap into that or not. Um, but Skylar, for you specifically, like, have you had one of these experiences where you were actually able to turn it around like maybe it was confrontational to begin with and there was this this weird competitive vibe and then you were able to somehow bridge that gap between what somebody thought what somebody's experience was of you but but something happened to where you were able to actually turn that around and they had a different perspective and a different experience of you yeah quite a few um one of the first ones that comes to mind though um was just working in a restaurant i worked at this super high-end sushi bar you know we had to learn japanese before we worked there it was very exclusive we had japanese customers um coming every day from all over the world um so it was like super exclusive um and maybe three months in one of the other servers i mean none of us talk we we're just there to work really um but three months in me and this girl we have become friends and she, i mean she told me straight up that i didn't like you when you first started working here um and i was like really and she was like yeah i just i thought that you had the perfect life i thought that you had everything together and now that i've gotten to know you um I realized that you have so much more depth than that. And it was super unfair for me to judge you like that. And I didn't even realize that she was doing that or that it had really bothered her so much. Um, 
another time, a different restaurant, um, I had gone from serving to being the marketing manager. And that was my first marketing manager position. Um, and honestly, the owner, the GM, he had laundered the money for our sign outside, right? So then they were like, okay, we're in downtown Denver. They're like, you guys need to go outside and get get tables. And the rest of the girls were very much like, no, that's not my job. I'm just going to sit up here. And I was like, okay, well, I need some tables. So I'm going to go out there. And I increased our business by over 400% every single time that I was standing outside and i so then that's how I became a marketing manager right um, and all the other servers were very upset they felt like I was the favorite which if you increase our business that much you are going to be the favorite you are literally feeding other people doing that um, and on that's actually how I got into modeling I tripped and fell into it but um those girls, I mean, they spread lies and rumors about me. They said that I slept with our boss to be able to get that position, which is absolutely not true. And um, so I ended up quitting actually, but Denver's pretty small. And later on me and those girls ended up working together somewhere else. And they would always ask me for modeling jobs. They would always ask me for work um, because I'm the one that is providing the value. I'm the one that is headhunting this work and now I have it available for other people. And uh, every single one of them came to me later and told me, you know, we're so sorry. And every job that I've ever had almost, some woman has ran me out and then later come to apologize. So I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm good at fixing it in the moment, but I am good at standing in my own truth and being like, no, this is still the person that I am. And, you know, eventually those people come around. So, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I guess we have a little visitor. A little visitor. He just we cannot do. help himself. <laughs> Well, Skylar, no, and thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I know that for me personally, uh, and I've had this, I mean, and Patty and I have actually talked about this. I've had this literally my whole life is, and I mean like since elementary school, is people saying things along the lines of nobody is that nice. Uh, and, oh, and that's a big one. Or nobody's huge. that happy. Nobody smiles that much. No one actually cares as much as you do. There must be a reason. There must be some ulterior motive. Which right. Really just lets you into how they truly think. Right. And, and, but I think it's like you said, like actually being able to process that in the moment, you know, and, and Skylar, do you mind sharing with us how old you are? Oh, I'm 32. So, I think the majority of us on the call are probably not 32 um, or um, actually I, I don't, I, you know, to be honest with you, I don't even know how old everybody is, but I'm just going to say, I think we have a variety of ages, but I also know um, like this comes with experience, right? But I also, I, I know you to be very intelligent and very well read and, and definitely doing, you know, the inner work of, you know, tapping into your own self-agency. But the truth of the matter is, and, and I'd love to open this up to the group, you know, how do we handle that when somebody confronts us with something that we know to be a truth about ourselves? And like I said, I've literally heard this my entire life. Um, no one is that nice. And it's, it's definitely lessened as I, as I got older and also as I changed the circle of people who I run with. Um, but I would be so defensive about it and so confused because I would think to myself, well, um, actually I, I am that nice and I'm also not that nice. Like, of course nobody is is that nice, but there was this experience that people had of me that I never got angry, that I never lose my cool, that, you know, I'm super even toned, you know, I make everybody feel like they're in this super meditative state. I am a human being, right? I am a human here, having a human experience, being the best that I can, learning on the daily. Um, but when we are constantly confronted with this idea or this experience that people have of us, like how do we confront that? And what I do now, which took years for me to really kind of unearth that, I just engage. 
Like if somebody is having an experience with me, it's like, then let's have a conversation about it. And what you were talking about, Skylar, when you said, well, that says more about them than it does about you. You know, my experience is that the people that don't want to engage or don't want to have a conversation about why are they having that experience. Um, and that's if I'm even interested in having that engagement. Right, like I don't need to put myself in, a, in an environment where it's super high risk, super toxic. In fact, I'll give everybody a super short uh, example. I was part of this um, really beautiful women's uh, mini pod, that's what they called it, and there were four of us. And one woman in particular, and this is the thing that I, I really want us to kind of unpack. I knew from the moment I met her online, so we've only met virtually, but I knew from the instant that we had this engagement um, that her, her level of need um, felt very high to me. And I'm not saying, I shouldn't say that I knew that, but my experience of her, like energetically, like I had this immediate experience with this person um, that she had a very high level of sensitivity and that she was going to require um, a lot of attention and kind of hand holding, and her neediness felt very high to me. And instead of handling it, like in the moment, going back to the person that was leading the group and just sharing that, like, I wasn't sure that this was going to be the right fit for me, I immediately found myself going into caretaker mode which is a total boundary bust of my own. So I wasn't honoring my own boundaries. But the point is, is that it just, the, the, the risk continued to elevate and the cost continued to get elevated because it seemed that the more I tried to be available and be really mindful about my language and, and I don't mean like swearing, I just mean the way that things were framed, um, the more her need increased. And so very quickly, like in a period of like three weeks, I was absolutely exhausted. And then she had opted to leave the group because there was one meeting that I couldn't be at. And I ended up getting this series of like 20 texts from her telling me how passive aggressive I am and that I need to look at my own stuff and that she can't trust me and she won't have a phone call with me, um, that it's too high risk for her. And I'm just like, I'm done. Like I, I'm, I'm done. And I tapped out and I sent a super short email to the facilitator and I said, you know what, I'm not going to bore you with the circumstances of what happened, but I'm going to take care of myself. I didn't set good boundaries. Um, I'm very concerned for the emotional well-being of this other person. Um, I need to step back. This is not what I signed up for. Um, I wish all of you nothing but the best. But the reason that I'm sharing that specifically is that it took me three weeks for me to like process all of this. And I'm sharing this with all of you also, because I'm still a work in progress. Like all of the work that I've done, all of the retreats that I've been to, all of the silent things and the, the, you know, all of the seminars, all of the workshops, all of the therapy, all of the books that I've read, I'm still a work in progress, right? Like I am still learning to navigate and have my own self agency and my own inner alchemy of my own self worth and recognizing when somebody comes into my sphere um, that is not good for me, that is not supportive, that feels toxic, that is um, where the risk is not worth the reward. And this particular person, I wish her well. I hope that she gets the support and the help and the love that she needs. Um, but I think for me too, it was recognizing that that is not my job, right? That my job is to be here, to do the work that I meant to do, to speak my own truth and to really be present for the experiences that are healthy and serving to me. And so what I'd really love to do, like I was saying, is open it up to the group and if anybody else has had an experience that you would like to talk about or process or unpack or get the support from the group um, of where you maybe have experienced either having a woman be incredibly supportive and really be a champion for you and celebrate you, or if you've had more of the opposite experience where you find yourself in circles or in situations with women who are still uh, maybe not as self-actualized, 
you know, where they're still kind of working through that competitive nature and it's you or it's me, it's me or it's them. So yeah, I would, I would really love to open it up and, and see um, what your experiences have been or what you're experiencing at this moment, like even during these times. So would somebody like to share? I'm not going to have crickets. <laughs> I just can't do it. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. You're welcome. That's, I know it happens. That's okay. Yeah, and I totally get that too because I do do uh, events like this where it's all women. And um, I'm going to say, I think for me in my world today, which is typically a predominantly male dominated world, shifting into a female dominated world, which is pretty amazing the women that I get to encounter are really supportive. Um, that's what attracted me to um, checking out this group. Another supportive woman said, Rita, you should check this out. So fantastic alignment with who you are. Um, so I, at least in the arena where I'm at, women are um, banding together and, you know, coming with those core, like a core value of love being first and, um, and being in that village mentality, because we're like, my saying is, right, it takes a village to raise children. But if we look at our screens right now, we are looking at a village of children. And we all get to help each other as we grow and progress. And so for me right now, that space is good. It wasn't always that way. When I was in corporate um, several, many years ago, um, it was completely the opposite. It was, you know, um, ideas being taken, um, just all sorts of negativity and quashing of spirit. Mm -hmm. And you, um, why do you think of all these things? And why do you care about people? You know, I, I even remember, gosh, now just very distinctly one, um, at one point in time when I was an, an administrative assistant, a, um, the the vice to vice principal of the company i asked how they were and they're like fine and i and they were like well how are you and i said well you know having a little bit of struggle but you know i'm doing okay and they're like you know what i didn't ask you because i cared i just asked to say hi at that moment it really changed um and i i still get emotional about that that someone could be in that space somebody i looked up to mm -hmm that really just didn't care because it was her job to be there. That was the space she was in, but I didn't have that mindset of understanding at that time. So for me, it was pretty hard and pretty harsh. Um, what that did is make me more set in my own values. I cared, I can continue to care and I'll go on doing that. And then that's what got me doing to what I do today and keep being connected with groups like this you know, I, I saw an article from Forbes that says groups of women like this help women live longer and healthier, which is super amazing, which means we're all doing the right thing when we're tapping into that space of being too nice or loving. I actually love that when I got on here, I heard endearing terms of how you were referencing one another. I just thought that was really beautiful and it touched my heart. So I, at least in my world, from what I see, it is progressing and women are progressing in this fashion, which is what the world needs today. So just want to say thank you for allowing me to share. Oh, Rita, thank you so much. And you know, something, I, and I, I'm not sure exactly what it was that you said, Rita, I was so engaged, but, but it conjured something up for me. Um, and I just feel compelled to, to say out loud, like not only for myself, but to all of us, is for us to be really mindful and aware of our silent judgments, right? Like even when we are in a group of women and we feel like, oh, this is my tribe and, um, but that we maybe have these experiences or these pings or these little moments where we're listening to someone talk or we're sitting at a table with someone and we are just feeling, um, like something doesn't feel right, like something doesn't feel aligned or attuned or, and, and I will share with you super candidly, like I've had this experience at a CWI event 
being at a table uh, with women and having a gentleman there and having this experience. And this was my experience and I didn't ask anybody else at the table, but I'm just trying to give an example um, of having this experience of this gentleman taking over the conversation and consuming what was really designed to be a collective conversation. And I remember feeling like I was seething inside, um, that I was so just like uh, uncomfortable. But what I didn't do at, at immediately or initially was then to engage him or have a different kind of conversation with him. I have since then. But if we can recognize in the moment as much as possible when that is happening, you know, when we are somehow getting triggered, uh, because I think that it potentially really also is trying to share something with us about ourselves. And I know for me, what it was bringing up for me was my dislike for the patriarchy. And, and it felt disrespectful and it felt like, oh my God, here we are once again, this guy comes in like Prince Charming and he's like, you know, got this, you know, swagger and this bravado going on. And like, he's going to like explain to these women how it is. And the truth of the matter is what I didn't consider in the moment was maybe his own nervousness mm -hmm. or his own insecurity or, um, whether he really values what he's doing, whether he's feeling like a fraud. And I also know I'm really good at what I do. And if I would have been able to, in that moment, you know, resist the temptation to judge and, and have my own stuff take over, I might've actually been able to, in that moment, somehow engage him or put my hand on his hand or say something to him to help bring him back into his body because it felt to me like he was operating from the neck up. Like it was so meta yeah. and it was so, um, it, it felt a little bit like a performance and what I could have done again in my lane of magic, in my area of genius and where, where I do my best work is to be present and to help pull him into the conversation because it really felt like he was outside of the conversation. And so I just wanted to share that with everybody to invite all of us to like, remember, like when we're in those moments and we're like, Oh my God, like I'm not liking this person for some reason. Um, kind of like Skylar was saying, like if we can tap into that empathy and just be like, okay, like what's really going on here? You know, I, I think that we, would not only have a better experience, but my gosh, how much could we contribute, you know, to this collective? And, you know, and I know um, somebody who I really admire and, and think the world of has been saying a lot recently, like, oh, I'm so sick of hearing, you know, that we're in this together, but we are. And I know that from my experience, like, but we've always been in it together. Right. Like there's this saying I love, it's pressure creates diamonds. And, you know, and I'd love to throw that out to everybody as well. Like what has this moment of pressure, um, like what diamonds are you creating out of, you know, as a result of, of this condition, of this new conditioning of this quarantine, which I know is beginning to shift a little bit for some people and other people are like, nope, I'm still on lockdown. Um, but, you know, in an effort to celebrate you, like that's what we're talking about tonight. Like how can we celebrate you and what diamonds are you creating through this little pressure cooker that we've been in? Well, I, I don't know about, um, about that particular topic. I was still kind of stuck on the other one. <laughs> oh, please, Patty. No, it just, I was just kind yeah. of going with it. So please. Um, I, you know, I had uh, kind of a unique experience, I guess, um, as you start growing up and you go like into junior high and high school and so forth, I didn't like girls very much. I found them to be mean and petty and competitive and backbiting and all of that. So my closest friends were, were boys. And then, you know, you get a little bit older and that starts to not be appropriate. You know, that your, your best friends are boys. You start getting into competition with women who think you're trying to take their their boyfriends away or their husbands away or, or what have you and 
and then uh, when I got into corporate, Rita, like you, you totally nailed it. When I was in corporate, it's like everybody's competing with everybody, you know, just trying to really find a good friend in that, in that kind of environment was, um, was pretty much next to impossible. Um, but I've had a really unique experience in the last few years. Um, when my, my high school was getting, I am definitely not Skylar's age, when my high school was getting ready to have its 40th reunion, uh, they created a Facebook page and started inviting all of us into this page and we all started getting to know each other. And so now, of course, you're, you're, you're in your late 50s, you know, and, and all the crap is over. You're not trying to prove to anybody anything. You know, everyone's had divorces and lost children and, and had, you know, financial setbacks and all of that. So nobody's trying to prove anything to anybody anymore. And getting rid of all of that just brought this amazing, um, I don't know, camaraderie and, and level playing field, I guess, to everybody. And in the course of all of that, I reconnected with, with three women, one that I, I was pretty good friends with in high school, one I, I had nothing to do with ever, and the other one was just kind of peripherally. And the four of us have become like so tight and such best friends because we've had we've gone through some shit together you know we've not together but we've all gone through some shit that was similar you know and it's um you know it's like I can at any time of the day text one of them and bam they're right there you know we get together about every three months you know hopefully as soon as this lockdown's over and we just pick up where we left off we cook together we walk together we drink wine together and it's I've never had that with women ever and I don't know if for myself if I had to reach a certain age before I was okay with that or, you know, like, I mean, does it say more about me than it does about everybody else, you know, that I had to get to that place? Mm. Thank you, Patty. You know, it's really, um, and thank you for the reminder, because I've had a lot of friends that, you know, uh, that would say like, oh, I'm definitely a guy's girl. Mm -hmm. um, and I know for me, I'm definitely a girl's girl. Uh, which I think also like goes back to why I probably had that experience with that handsome gentleman um, because I'm a champion for women, even though I've not always experienced women being a champion for me. Um, my, my challenge has sometimes been that my expectations are actually higher for women, um, that I expect more from women than I do from men, which has been an interesting um, experience. And, and yet, uh, you know, I can just speak for myself, like I have, um, you know, in the past had, you know, boyfriends or significant others that, um, you know, strayed or meandered or cheated or whatever. And I would end up meeting these women who they cheated on me with and having these really interesting conversations. And inevitably when those types of things would happen um, and thank God it was only a few times, but the women would always say like, why are you, um, why are you being so nice to me? Um, and it wasn't a matter, I didn't feel like I was being so nice to them. I just wanted to really understand. Um, and I just had this ability for empathy and compassion and, uh, and to recognize how human we all are you know, uh, but I don't, I don't know if any of you have had that experience, but, but I definitely, uh, yeah, I, I just kind of, and it was, it was a rude awakening for me when I realized that my expectations for women were higher. Uh, like I just expected more from us. I felt like we could, like we could handle it. Like we're better than that. And not that we're better than men, but that we could, that we could manage this um, because I think so much of women. So that was, that was an interesting turning point for me as well, which I'm obviously still practicing. Right. Um, but thank you for, for sharing that Patty. That was, that was really something. Um, and would, would anybody else like to share what your experience has been of either celebrating or being celebrated of competing with or being competed with? Uh, when it comes to, you know, there being enough. And Skylar, I know that you wanted to share some things too. Oh, Adrian, did you want to share something, honey? I just wanted to share something that um, you guys were talking about, uh, both Rita and Patty had mentioned in the corporate 
world that particularly, and especially if there's very few women um, in your in your field or your department, um, you know, sometimes it just works out that way. But um, and certainly there are plenty of male dominated fields. But I read a book uh, by Jessica Bennett called The Feminist Fight Club. And it was a number of years ago, so I hope I have this number right, but I recall reading something that was an aha moment, which is that when there's only one woman, it's very hard to speak up and it's very hard to speak honestly because you're in this position of representing all women. Um, and it feels very personal and yet very universal at the same time. When there's two women, it's very competitive. When there's three women, you often women are more, much more likely to speak up and feel like, hey, there's somebody else that might back me up. Whether or not it's because they're women, but there is, it takes at least three to kind of quell that sort of, you know, I can say this because there's some men here. Um, you know, that kind of machismo, that male energy and that need to, to kind of dominate that you referred to. Um, so I think that, that that also may be some of what we're experiencing. And Rita, you were talking about the shift that you've seen in your industry and how that's helped. And I think that it has because suddenly you don't either have to be the single representative for all, all females in your industry, um, where if you make a mistake or say something that somebody takes issue with, it's this crushing blow. Um, and you don't have to feel like, oh, there is only one spot. And oh my God, I have to, you know. So anyway, I do hope things are changing. I certainly know as I've, and maybe it is just an issue of getting older where there's just like, you know, no competition or something because I have certainly found actually since becoming a, a business owner and not being in corporate quite frankly is where I have the most um, support from other women and just other business owners in general mm -hmm. so anyway that's it beautiful and it was the feminist fight club Adrian yes uh, the author's name is Jessica Bennett she Love writes it. a lot for the New Yorker and magazines like that Thank you, Adrian. Maybe we should have another conversation at some point around feminism. I, I think that that's a pretty interesting topic and a lot of uh, a lot of diverse opinions about it. So, but thank you, Adrian, so much. Would anybody else like to share? I'll oh, share. I, uh, you know, I was in healthcare for a very long time and in leadership in healthcare. And as you may know, healthcare has a lot of females in that industry. Of course, men yes. too. And this is my experience. At the leadership level, it was a very interesting experience for me. And I transitioned from nursing administration to hospital administration. And in the leadership level, I found that I got along and worked better with my male counterparts than I did with my female counterparts. So the male counterparts were willing to, if I had an issue or something I needed explanation, especially being new in that area, they were willing to help. The women looked at it as they were competing with me. It's interesting because I remember that book that Michelle, Michelle from CWI authored. It's talk about, this refers to women sabotaging sabotaging themselves. I recommend that book. It's very good because it gives you some insights in the fact that how men look at women. And it was very interesting because in her book, she relates to the fact that men look at women as being very competitive with each, with each other and men work together more collaborative, which is very unusual for us because most most people think women are collaborative. We tend to be collaborators. However, in the work environment, we're very competitive. And so I had a very challenging time working with women, especially at my level. And of course, even women that I, I had to lead and be their uh, boss, executive, etc. And I found that what I did to help me was I came from a position of first recognizing the issue really wasn't me, identifying it wasn't me. 
coming from a position, and I like Sean Marie's comment when it comes to being judgmental, not being judgmental. And you know what? We're all judgmental. And I had to recognize that I was very judgmental too. And so I had to come from a place of compassion and empathy. And at the same time being humble, because I knew my job, I did very well at it. And the president had a lot of respect for me and the physicians had a lot of respect for me. So there was a lot of envy around that. So I had to come from a, a more humble place, making myself, being authentic, but being willing to be exposed and be vulnerable so that others will recognize I'm just another human being and really be present and be available and in the conversation with those women. And it's, it's a whole process that I, it's, I'm still a work in progress and I'll be forever until I die. But I love what Sean Marie says because it's, it's one of those things where I felt the only way I could do what I did to survive it was to do the inner work. I really had to work on myself and really get to know who I am. And as I said, it's a work in progress, but it's really a lot of deep work that one has to do in order to tolerate sometimes these toxic environments, especially mm -hmm. in corporate America. It's extremely challenging. I'm, I'm from the Caribbean and I, you know, and here is a Caribbean woman, a black woman, one of the youngest ones in that area, in that level. And I had to really cope with all of that. So I really had to really understand myself and recognize I'm vulnerable too, and recognize I do have my issues too, and just kind of be present. And I had to forgive myself, forgive them. But I can tell you, it's not an easy situation with us trying to move forward. However, in the long run, it's so important for us to all continue to come from a place of abundance rather than coming from a place of scarcity and recognizing that that individual or those ladies have something to contribute just like we do. And being the listening to recognize that and actually complimenting and supporting them authentically when the opportunity arises. Mm. Absolutely, Elizabeth. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. And it is about that authenticity and, oh my gosh, being vulnerable. And I'm sure that I'm sure that most of you have seen uh, Brene Brown's TED Talk on, on vulnerability and, oh my goodness. And, and you know what I have found to, and, and Elizabeth, thank you for talking about leadership. I think the best leaders and the leaders that I have experienced that have just really like moved me like heart and soul um, have been the best listeners. Like I think a great leader is a great listener. And who was it? Um, Rita, I think it was you that it was you, Rita, when you said um, that, that this woman asks you a question and she's like, oh, I wasn't really asking. Like, I mean, that, I mean, what kind of leadership is that, right? And and I know for myself, in fact, Skylar has been with me and maybe Adrian has too when this has happened, but, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not saying this as a way of um, like blowing my own horn. I'm saying this because it is something that I have seen has a profound effect on people, but I don't care if we're at a concert or at a coffee shop, but I've had this experience with strangers and with servers um, that'll come over to take our order. And I just really genuinely acknowledge them. And I've had this response back of like the waiter, the waitress, like almost like wants to come and join us and like sit at our table. And, and I don't think it's because I'm special or I've done anything special. I think it speaks to how hungry people are to be genuinely seen and recognized and acknowledged. And that's just who I am as a human being and I'm not perfect and I'm not saying it happens at, at every single, you know, that I'm, that I'm constantly in that present state of awareness. But, but what it shows me every single time is how hungry we are for that authentic connection, right? right. To really, to really feel celebrated as a human being, like just to have somebody like, and, and Rita, I'm so like, mm, 
like from my heart to yours, I'm sorry that you had that experience. And I'm so grateful that you shared that with us. But the fact, like, I don't know how long ago that was, but like, even when you were sharing it with us, you said like, gosh, it, it still makes me emotional because it, it hurts us to our core when we are present and available for a real life, real moment experience. And that's the risk, right? Is to be open to have that kind of experience and to have it go sideways and to have somebody be um, dismissive that way. It's real and it's painful. And the, the beauty of it, the other side of it, the silver lining, if you will, is that we then get to come together in an experience like this and say, you know what, that's not who I want to be. I learned from that experience. That's not the experience I want other people to have. So, but yeah, thank you girls so much. And Elizabeth, thank you for that, that beautiful share. Um, Michelle, did you want to say something, honey? I know that we had opened it up. I think that you were going to share something. Yeah, thank you, um, everybody, for sharing. Um, it's funny, when I was in the corporate world, even my last firm that I was with, it was all about competition. It didn't really matter if it was male or female. It was always, I have to, I have to be better than you. I have to be number one. Um, I will do whatever it takes to make sure that you don't beat me. Mm -hmm. And I found with this new firm I'm with, and especially with the, not with all the ladies, um, but with, with, a, you know, with the ladies I associate with in my firm, we're all about like, I want to see you win. And the biggest note, the biggest difference that I've noticed is a scarcity sure. mindset versus an abundance mindset. So when I, when I've surrounded myself, um, especially around women with abundant mindsets, mm -hmm. they're all about what can we do to support you? What can we do to make, help you win? There's enough for everybody else to go around, which one is one of the reasons why I love CWI is I find that most of the people here, um, you know, even being financial services is how can we support somebody in such a male dominated industry? is um, how, how can we support each other and make each other stronger? And for me, it's, it really comes down to that, that difference between abundance and scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, because if you believe that there's enough out there for everybody else, then you don't need to compete with anybody except making sure you're better than you were yesterday. So you're only competing with yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that's like, that's been one of my biggest lessons this past year and a half with this new firm is, and it's ran the, the CEO on the insurance side is a man and he's, um, you know, his testosterone definitely shows through when he's doing our sales meeting and, um, you know, he's like, I'm going to kick everybody's butt this month. And, and, and then us women kind of just laugh and roll our eyes. And then we're like, okay, what can we do to make, you know, like, how can we support each other? and making each other better. And um, I, I, I really think that's the difference is the, the abundance versus the scarcity mindset. Um, when everybody thinks that they're gonna win, then why, why do you have to compete with each other? It's like that whole idea of for me to win, you have to lose. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's ones and zeros and ons and off. Mm. Tyler, honey, I know that you had some things that or something that you wanted to share or read to us. Um, and it's so interesting. It's been brought up a few times about the, the scarce mentality and the, the sense of lack. And so did you want to, did you want to speak a little bit to that, Skylar? Yeah, I mean, everything that y'all are saying is really resonating, but especially what you are saying, Michelle. Um, yeah, the scarcity versus abundance mindset. Um, and just envy in general too. Um, it's not just being jealous of something that someone else has, but like to the point of you not wanting them to have it, like you feeling like there isn't, there's really only enough to go around. So when we are constantly thinking or brooding in our envy, um, we're also subconsciously telling ourselves that we're inferior, that there isn't enough to go around and that the universe is limited and the universe can't give us what we truly desire when we're in the, that type of mindset. Um, it can't, there, there's no way because you're telling the universe that it's literally not possible. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're so focused on those other people or what they're doing or what they have and that we don't, um, it's really stopping from finding our true why, 
you know, figuring out what it is that we really do want and being able to make ourselves happy and fulfilled because, I mean, we're focused on that. And I think a great example of that is Michael Phelps in the Olympics, right? So I think, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but another swimmer that he was swimming against was just constantly looking to see where Michael was instead of focusing on himself. And it caused him to lose by this much. Instead of focusing on himself, his strokes, what he was doing, he was focusing on his competition and ultimately that caused him to lose. And I just think that that really goes back into our lives. It's really like, what do you actually want? You know, you may be jealous, you may feel envious, but to really be able to get the things that you truly want, you have to be able to define that to move forward. And you can't do that when you're looking at what someone else constantly has. Um, and so, um, let me see, what was your name? Elizabeth, I think that you had some great, I mean, just all, all of the advice that you had as far as how you've dealt with this in the corporate world um, were a lot of the things that I had written down to about how to, how to stop these things. Um, and so a few of the things that I wrote down was really focusing on the good in our own lives, being grateful, you know, what we do when we're constantly looking at the things that we lack we can't get more in our lives we can't get the good things because all we're doing is looking at the negative it's really hard our brains get addicted to either the positive or the negative things that we're we're focusing on it literally cannot be addicted to both it can only be addicted to one or the other and the chemicals in our brains are nearly identical but it will take us on that role of whichever one we choose um so being grateful, I think, is is a big piece at, um, at the heart of being able to stop this type of envy in ourselves. I mean, we can't control where that envy comes from everyone else, but the one thing that we can control is where it comes from in ourselves. So being grateful, um, reminding ourselves that no one has it all, no one does, not me, not you, there's no one, um, we really can't focus on that. And I mean, we all know we're older, we've had a lot of experiences, like you were saying, going back to your 50th or 40th um, high school reunion, you know, seeing that mindset change um, really does do a lot for people, avoiding people who focus on those things. And that for me, I think is why it's so easy for me to do the INFJ door slam, you know, and cut people out. And maybe that isn't the healthiest and I'm also still learning, you know, but for me, it's, you know, okay, I'd rather not be part of this than try to figure out how to make it work. Um, so that's something that I'm personally working on. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being an INFJ. <laughs> <laughs> we're here. <laughs> we are, and we're not going anywhere. No, we're not. Um, spending time with grateful people, women like you, um, and really just understanding too, like how our culture, whether it's our work culture, our social culture, financial culture, um, and marketing, perpetuate so much of this in our in our lives of this feeling of lack like do you really feel like if you hadn't seen someone else have it would it really be bothering you that much you didn't wake up this morning thinking oh I need that I'm I'm envious that someone else has it no you know it's not like that um so really just realizing where that comes from so much of that is fed to us to create this monster culture that we live in we all know it's unhealthy um so being, I guess, more mindful and cognizant of that, like you said, um, celebrating the success of others, um, which any little time and moment that I've had to be able to do that, especially for my haters, I love to do that because I know and realize that there's something missing inside of them. And a lot of times it is that recognition. It is that feeling validated, that feeling heard that causes people to act like this, um, and that joy is not a finite resource. Like we all have the potential mm. to be joyous, to be feel happy. Um, it's just because they have it doesn't mean that we can't have it. Um, and ultimately like those things, those relationships, like those all create that feeling of joy in us. So it's not that you really want those things, it's that we want joy and we're not sure how to give that to ourselves. Um, and then the last one was like, be generous. So making it an essential habit to share our resources, to share our time, to share our talents, because we're able to validate ourselves and realize that we do have so much more to give, that, that we are validated, that we, that we just are, and that we're allowed to be when we're able to give to other people and 
um, when we can see where other people are coming from, from having those experiences, I think it makes us have a more well-rounded idea of where everyone is coming from and where we fit into the world. And that just by being ourselves that we do provide value in the world, whether or not we have the fancy car or the, all the best relationships, you know, we have that potential to put just, I mean, just being ourselves and just being, we put that into the universe. So. Mm. Skylar, thank you so much, honey. That was so beautiful. And, you know, and I just, I, I want to tell all of you really quickly, just um, like the Reader's Digest version. Uh, I was outside looking for one of our nine billion cats. Um, the, ones that are, the ones that just had kittens. <laughs> <laughs> I was, actually, I was looking for one of the pregnant moms. Um, oh my God, that's a whole nother story. Um, but this girl was walking down the street with her dog and uh, I don't know, she said, I don't, I honest to God, I, I don't exactly know how it happened, but I'm out in the front yard looking for this cat. This girl's walking down the street with her dog. I think actually, Skylar, I asked you about your dog. Um, but Skylar and I just struck up this conversation and she's this beautiful, like breathtaking young woman with this adorable dog. And we just started having this conversation and it was so organic and open and I felt like I'd known her my whole life and you know and if I wasn't in the place where I am or done the work that I've done like I could have looked at this woman and immediately started comparing myself or being like oh my god I wish I was 20 years younger or like whatever psycho babble nonsense goes on in our mind and we don't know why people cross our paths and not everybody we meet is meant to be like this big love affair or a lifelong friend or but just being open to the experience. And we started having this conversation and then I think a week later we got together for coffee and um, it's just, I mean, I, I can't, like, it's so weird. Like I don't remember my life without this friendship in it. And it's just so beautiful. And Skylar, I do celebrate you and I am such a champion for you. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share something without revealing anything too intimate or, um, personal, but Skylar, I also know like joy has not been um, for many of us uh, during this whole time. Like joy has not been uh, necessarily immediately accessible. Like we've had to like consciously be like, oh gosh, that's right. It it isn't a finite resource. I do have access to joy, but the work of of reconnecting to that joy during this time of isolation, and I know that that you've personally had moments um, where that joy felt out of reach. And, um, and I just, I wanna thank you personally for showing up today and being such a beautiful spirit. And, and Skylar, truly, you're one of the most generous people I've, I've met in a really long time, like just genuinely um, generous. And I loved what you had to share and I'm just super, super grateful for you being here tonight. So. Um, thank you, my friend, so much. And and to whatever is next for you, Skylar, I know that you are in a transition and your industry is changing and uh, I wish you nothing but huge success and your heart's desire, whatever that might be. And, you know, a couple of you brought up um, the topic of envy, which I think is really important. And one of the one of the most powerful things I've heard about envy is that is to be curious and be willing to explore our envy because it will probably lead us to our heart's desire. So I think if we could learn to have a different experience and a different relationship with envy and just be like, oh gosh, like why am I, like what is this envy really about? Like if we were to get into the roots of it and even going back to the experience I shared with everybody about the gentleman, like part of that for me might have been how gregarious he is because the truth of the matter is I'm actually an introvert and I get mistaken as an extrovert and I don't really have that. I can hold a space like that, but I'm not necessarily comfortable with it. And I think what I was doing was assuming in that moment that this man was really comfortable being so captivating and that is not my immediate go-to. So I just want to also invite all of us to maybe explore our relationship with envy when it comes up, 
right? Which again, requires that we be present and vulnerable and truthful um, and kind to ourselves and empathetic with ourselves that that's what we're actually experiencing in the moment. Like, oh gosh, like this feels like jealousy. This feels like envy. Um, I'm going to give myself a little like love tap on the shoulder and be like, it's okay, but what's it about? Like, instead of us like pushing it down or judging ourselves or pretending that we're not envious, um, like just letting it come to the surface and be like, gosh, that's curious. Like, that's interesting. Like, what is that really about for me? So yeah, this could, I could, I could go on all night with you girls, but um, Patty, I, I want to acknowledge our time. I know Patty is our, uh, our wonderful producer as well as my partner in crime. Um, but Patty, I wanted to share just a couple of other things and share a link. Do we have a few minutes for that? Sure. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to share a link in the chat box. Uh, so for any of you that have, have never seen this, it's about a two and a half minute commercial that Elle magazine put out. Um, and it's, uh, it's Chelsea Handler talking about, uh, so Chelsea Handler is a comedian and an author for those of you that know her. And she and a friend of hers were doing the comedy circuit around the same time. And, uh, and this friend of hers kind of came to it, if I recall the story correctly. Um, she was kind of interested, but not really like it wasn't necessarily like, oh my God, I want to be this famous comedian. And this friend of hers ends up getting picked up for this gig. Like, I think it was like SNL or like this really big thing. And Chelsea didn't. She's like, you know, like, what the hell? Like, I wanted this my whole life. I've been working for this my whole life. And you end up getting picked and I don't. And she was talking to her sister about it. And what she said was, you know, Chelsea, it's like, it's okay to celebrate her. Like, you're, like, you're going to get yours. Like, you're going to have your moment. And Chelsea ends up saying this beautiful thing. She said, I realize that I don't have to blow out somebody else's candle for my own to shine brightly. And the, the link that I shared with all of you is, is, the, is the much more beautifully put story. But, but in essence, that was it, that, that we don't have to blow out somebody else's candle for our own to shine brightly, you know, for our own magic to be out in the world. And I just thought that was so beautiful. So I hope all of you, I think like it said, it's like two and a half minutes. It's not very long. Um, but yeah, so if, I mean, if I were to make a declaration, it would be that I, like, I don't want to blow out anybody else's candle. I want to encourage your candle to be, be forever lit and burned brightly and for you to find your heart's desire and, and to feel supported and seen and heard and to know how much you matter. And I would love to ask, like, does anybody else have any closing comments? Patty, do you have anything that you want to share? Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up our, our, wonderful, uh, our wonderful forum for the night? You look like an angel with the light. Oh my God. You are a lovely oh, angel. Am I getting that? I don't, I have it, I have it on speaker view. Oh, you know that I know I need to get like a little curtain or something up there. Um, actually, you know, for, for those of you that are members of CWI, um, I'm sure that you heard that we lost, uh, we lost one of our members a couple of weeks ago, Eve Ensler. And uh, I had the, the distinct pleasure of being in an inner circle with her and uh, Adrian, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to out you, but um, Adrian and I were in an inner circle group with Eve and um, we were, uh, we loved Eve very much and we definitely felt like she was ours. Like, you know, talk about celebrating somebody and um, like we just took her in and we embraced like she was ours like she was our Eve um, and I just was thinking about her Skylar when you pointed out that light like I feel like she might she might just be with us here tonight and, and that just might be her so Eve if it's you honey I hope that we're doing you proud and we we miss you terribly so um, yeah to, to the memory of, of Eve Gumpel um, who I love completely and who we miss terribly. 
up. But I want to thank all of you for being here tonight for another episode of Truth is the New Black. And I hope that you will join us again. We'll be back next month. Uh, my guest next month is uh, Susie Clisson. And we were talking about generosity and that the get is in the give. I had the pleasure of having Susie on my radio show uh, last month, which is called Business is Personal. And it was such a great talk that we're going to bring it back for Truth is the New Black. And Patty hosts some wonderful shows and she hosts uh, an online forum called In the Ladies Room. So if you're not already on the list, I, I really encourage you to check out Patty's events as well. She's a wonderful facilitator. And I just want to thank all of you. And I will, I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes um, from one of my favorite writers. His name is Tony Hoagland. And he has this to say, some people think the truth is the worst thing that can happen. The truth is not the worst thing that can happen. So with that, everybody, thank you so, so much. Love to you. Much success. I see you. I hear you. And I celebrate you. So good night, everybody. Thank you for being here. Bye. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Skylar. Of course. It was great being with you, ladies. I always appreciate you. You too, honey. Bye, Bye. everybody.